as, as y'all know, um, growing up, uh, I've always been uh, involved with sports and playing sports. Um, one of my favorite things is, uh, one of my favorite things as a kid growing up was always, uh, was when we would do like travel tournaments or all-star tournaments. Um, so what, this is before like travel ball took over the world when it came to baseball. Um, what, what we did was, is we would play rec ball for a while, right, for a couple of months, and then we would select an all-star team, and then that all-star team would go play the little travel tournaments. Now, remember, uh, throughout the course of the year, what would end up happening is, is we would play, we would all get dirty, and like our pants would slowly become more and more orange and stained and green, right? Like, it was great. Um, we would finish out the year, and then we would go and play these travel tournaments, and our travel tournament uniforms were very simple. It was a hat and a t-shirt, usually a puke puke yellow uh, Central Lafouche t-shirt and a green hat, right? That's what we played with pretty much everywhere we ever went. It was great. Um, what would happen though is we would show up and when we would play, we look like the Bad News Bears. Like our, our pants are like busted up and kind of blown out and like they're, they're stained and the, the shirt wasn't pretty and the hat wasn't very, didn't ever really fit right. Um, our coaches, our, all of our dads were all wearing shorts that were a little bit too short, right? With the sunglasses, standing on third base like, ah, we know they were drinking beer in the parking lot the whole time before they came. But, like, our team, like, we did not look like a professional team whatsoever. We were looking rough. Um, but when we would show up to these tournaments, the other teams were, like, styling. They were showing up matching cleats, matching socks, matching pants, matching shirt, matching hat, matching bat bags. Their, their gloves were, were, like, the color-coded kind of thing as their stuff. Like, it was beautiful. And the funnest part about travel ball for me was when we would 10 rule, run rule a team that looked like that, right? They looked like professionals. They looked great. And then when we'd show up looking terrible, what would happen? We would just destroy them. It was so much fun. It was like, I don't care about your cleats, you're slow, right? I don't care about your glove, you can't throw. I don't care if you got a $300 bat. If you don't hit the ball, it don't work, right? So I remember like growing up, there was something about this though that was just very, very powerful and fun because... There's something about a good upset that every one of us get behind, right? Unless your team is the favorite, right? Game two in a little while. Anyway, um, there's something about a good upset that a lot of people like just enjoy, that we like to get behind. And I think one of the main things about a good upset, and, and I had coaches all my life that talked about this, is that when you show up, you have to have belief or you have to have confidence that you belong. I'll use an example. Uh, the, greatest, the greatest team that was ever put together in any sport ever was the 1992 uh, Olympic basketball team for the United States, otherwise known as the Dream Team. Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, Mar Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, uh, Rich Mullins, David Robinson, uh, Carl Malone, Christian Leitner, he was not quite, he should have, Shaq should have been there. But anyway, like the greatest team that was ever put together, Clyde Drexler, um, like Charles Barkley, I could go on. <laughs> this is really sad. Um, the greatest team that was ever put together in any team sport whatsoever was the 1992 Olympic Dream Team. And, and, and like any other team that plays in the Olympics, they had to qualify to play. So some people, there's documentaries and things that show this, but some people don't know this, that they actually played their first tournament was actually in the United States in Oregon, in Portland. And when they showed up, they were sitting there, it was the, uh, the Tournament of the Americas or Tournament of the Roses, or something. I forget what it's called. It, it was, but it was a tournament that they had to play, and they had to win this tournament to qualify. Now, everyone knew that they were going to destroy North America, all of the Americas, that they were going to beat everybody. This was the best team ever. So when they showed up, they, they get announced, and their first game that they have to play is against Cuba's national team. And actually, Charles Barkley was interviewed about this. That when they showed up on the court, they announced Larry Bird and Magic Johnson and, and Michael Jordan, all these Hall of Famers and all these amazing players that have been on TV that, have, that are, are the poster children of the NBA. They, they show up, and after they announce, they, the two teams start to kind of shake hands in the middle of the court, just like good luck and all this kind of stuff. And the Cuba national team basically turned around, dropped to a knee, and was waiting for a picture to be taken. They, they all wanted to just be in a picture with this team. Charles Barkley said, at that point, we knew this wasn't a basketball game, that this was a showcase. This team was never going to beat them. 
Because this team, this, this, a national team, looked at these guys and they were there as spectators who happened to be wearing a jersey. That was it. They had no belief, no confidence that they could even compete. The final score ended up being that the, the U.S. won by 77 points. Blew them out. There was no confidence. There was no belief. You could even say that there was probably some fear of how bad we're going to do. Because they were there as fans first, not as players. If, if we contrast that with 12 years earlier, in 1980, in the Olympics, in the medal round, the U.S. and Russia, or U.S. and Soviets played hockey, and a team that had no business being on the, on the same ice as the Soviets ended up pulling off a win. The Soviets were four-time Olympic, uh, Olympic gold medalists, and they were going for number five. They weren't going to lose. A month before, they had beaten the U.S. 10 to, seven, 10 to 3 in a hockey game. That's not a football score. That's a hockey game. That's that weird sport where people play on ice, right? Um, like, there was no reason these two should be on the same team. But Herb Brooks, the, co the coach of the U.S., had basically instilled in the, his team, in his group of 20-something-year-olds, college students, that, hey, we belong there. We belong on the ice. We're playing an extension of the Red Army, but we belong there. And we're better than them. Herb Brooks' speech could, be, could sound a little bit like what Jesus said today in our Gospel. Do not be afraid. Fear no one. Fear no one. An upset can never take place in sports if you're afraid of the team that you're playing. It can't and will not happen. If I'm, a, if I'm playing a sport and I look across the field and I see a team that is too big, too fast, and too good, then guess what? I might as well pack up and go home. Because we're going to lose. While this might be true in sports, it's true in our culture. If we look at our culture and we say, oh, things are too bad, they're too far gone, they're too hopeless, then no wonder we continue to get our teeth kicked in. No wonder we continue to get beat up. Jesus never said it would be easy to spread the gospel. In fact, he said the opposite. He encouraged his apostles and said, Fear no one. Fear no one. Not those in power, not those who might have some influence. Fear no one. He says this to the apostles. He says this to those who are following him around, that he formed friendships with, that he formed a relationship with, that he equipped, and then that he sent out at the end of his life. And he says, fear no one. And the, the, the one who's supposed to be the leader of the apostles does a really, really good job of breaking that rule almost immediately. Because Peter is, with, is walking with Jesus every step of the way. Peter is listening to everything P Jesus got for him. Jesus, J Peter actually gets some answers right from time to time. But he's the leader. And the moment that Jesus is arrested, Peter fails. We hear about it in Scripture. You were, you were with him. I saw you. You were with him in the temple area. I don't know him. <laughs> no, 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 you were. You were with him. You were with him in the garden when he was arrested. No, I, Who are you talking about? No, not me. I've seen you with him. You're his friend. You must be mistaken. It's someone else. And the rooster crows. It, it, it happens... In, in Scripture, and, and I think, I know I do this, and I've said this before, I could look at Scripture and be like, come on, Peter, like, really? 
You could have, you couldn't have like gotten a couple of months, but like you got like ten minutes, dude. Like you, you got a half a chapter in, and you're already denying them. But if we're honest, if I'm honest with myself, I don't know if I would be any different. Because Peter's life is on the line. Peter very well could be on a cross right next to him. And he hides. And he runs. And he's afraid. We would like to think that this still ha- this, this happens 2,000 years ago and it would never happen again, but we know that's not true. Like imagine at work, if, hey, uh, we're asking you to promote this thing and I don't agree with this thing, my faith says opposite of this thing. Like uh, just imagine if you're at work and you say, no, I'm not going to promote fill in the blank thing because I'm a Christian. The blowback, the ostracizing, the gossip that's going to go behind your back, right? The possibility of losing a job. Those are real circumstances. But does fear dictate it in our life? There's no hope of overcoming that fear if we don't truly believe the gospel that we profess. Last week, um, I, myself and Miss Sissy went to, uh, went to Focus's uh, training. They, they, they bring all the missionaries together, Focus missionaries that we have, right? They bring all the missionaries together, they train them for a few weeks, and then they send them out to their campuses. Uh, so we were able to go up and be with them, and it, it was great. One of the presentations that we heard was from a, a chaplain at a certain at, at, at a university in, in Nebraska, and he said he, he told us he said um, he, he used this line and I wrote it down. I, I thought it was fantastic. He said, "Nothing will happen in the church if we are not convinced that the good news is if that we're not more convinced of the good news than we are of the bad news." Now the word "good news," right? The, the gospel. The word "gospel" means good news. Nothing will happen if we're not more convinced of the gospel than we are of the bad news. It's like when we're doom scrolling on Facebook and just wondering what's the next explosion that's about to happen and the next, the next crazy thing and the next thing I should be angry about. Are we more convinced of the good news or of the bad news? Do we believe better in the good news or in the bad news? Because it's real easy sometimes as we're inundated with the bad news, as we're inundated with why we should be angry at those people, why we should be upset about this thing. It's really easy sometimes just to sit there and stew in the bad news. But we as Christians are not supposed to just be consumed and overrun by the bad news. We're supposed to live our life according to the gospel, according to the good news. What does it look like to live convinced of the bad news is that we look like we're, we're against a lot of things. I'm against those people. I'm against that thing. I'm against, and it's anger a lot of times that's thrown out. But when we're convinced of the good news, when we live according to the good news, well, I can endure all things. I can hope all things because love is the thing that drives. My love for God first and foremost, and it animates what I do. When I'm convinced of the good news, I'm convinced that Jesus Christ came to earth, died and rose, and I have hope for eternal life, despite anything of the world. Despite what ridiculousness is preached by our politicians, despite what ridiculousness is shown on a TV screen, despite what is promoted by a baseball team, anything else goes away whenever I am first and foremost convinced that God wins. And if we don't have hope in that, if we don't have confidence in that, then like any other upset, we're going to lose. This is why we're here today. We're at Mass today Not to get our cookie and go home. Not not to check a box because Maman said so. 
right? We're at Mass today because we are coming to testify and show and reveal in our body and who we are that Jesus Christ came to earth, died, wants to feed us and send us out. We're coming to say yes to the Gospel. Yes to the good news. And that's a whole lot, uh, that, that's a whole lot more fruitful than just saying no to everything else. Today as we come to Mass, may we have the courage that the early apostles had. That, that we could have the same courage that the early apostles had that where they said yes and it would cost them. <laughs> they said yes even in the face of fear. They said yes even in the face of being discredited or being talked about. But that, it became, that, that their yes became something that was all-consuming in all parts of their life. Today, as we come to, we come to Mass, we, we say yes to the Lord. That fear will not drive us. Fear will not hide us. That what we hear in the church, we will shout from the housetops, as we heard today in our Gospel. Fear no one. This is Jesus' words to His apostles, to His followers. And those words echo down now 2,000 years later to us. That we live our faith boldly, profoundly, and loudly. <laughs> not, not inhibited by fear. May today we fall deeper in love with the Lord. That we would not be distracted by the bad news of the world but that we would be animated by His good news.